Well, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, whenever and wherever you guys are. Glad you joined us for uh, Across the Round Table. Yes. What is this? <laughs> We've renamed our uh, YouTube channel, Jerry, to Across the Round Table. So I like it. appreciate you soldiering this out with me all this time. You bet. And so if you see Across the Round Table and in the, in the uh, links, you know that the name of the channel has changed. I've taken my name off front and center to make it about what we do here. We talk across this round table yes we talk across this table to you guys and when you comment you're talking across the table to us and it's a it is a round table my yes, father built is. this table many many years ago so i'll keep this for our ongoing projects you here betcha. well and we're continuing on our study last week you guys were out you were out yeah, sick so we canceled a little sick much how, better how are you doing tonight? i'm great back to my old self and wife's still in the weather so a little bit? still feeling a little bad yeah but She's on the mend. All right, we'll keep we'll pray for Nancy. Yes. And hope that she gets one hundred percent. Yes, you seem like you're doing great, man. I'm doing great. I'm I'm fine. Strong immune system. Oh yeah. Right. <laughs> well, we're in part four of our study in Roman Catholicism, and we're going to continue looking at the topic of sola scriptura. Right. Scripture is the basis for all doctrine. So let's jump in both feet. Let's do it. Consider some of the specific examples of oral tradition in the Catholic Church which were modified, nullified, or denied. Hmm. Like the alliteration there? I do. <laughs> throughout the ages. <laughs> modified, nullified, or denied. Here's some examples. We'll alternate these yeah, if you don't mind. Yeah, yeah. Proverbs 8, 22 through 23. The Lord brought me forth as the first of his works before his deeds of old. I was formed long ago, ages ago, at the very beginning when the world came to be. So the context of this verse is wisdom. Wisdom in poetic fashion, it's personalized. Uh, this is a common Hebraic literary tool. Yeah, so I like Jesus' wisdom in the New Testament, Logos, right. divine knowledge. And so it's a personification of who he is. Right. In the Old Testament, we see this sort of a thing, a personification of different attributes of right. God. Wisdom he, is one of those. Yeah, even described as her. Mm -hmm. So, Does it mean that it's has a specific gender? No. Does it mean that it uh, has... Uh, Double X chromosomes, right. not referring to biological nature, but to, yeah. to literary, right? Yeah. In 15080, Justin Martyr in Dialogue, chapter 129, defined wisdom as Jesus Christ in this passage. Mm. So the result of this mis misinterpretation would make Jesus a created being. Ah, because the, the verse said, the Lord brought me forth as first of his works. Right. So Justin Martyr thought, well, who's the Logos New Testament is Jesus? That must be the Logos in Pro this Proverbs 8 chapter. So Jesus must have been created. Mm. Wow, that's a problem. Yeah, in fact, the heretic Arius, uh, the 4th century bishop in Alexandria, used this oral tradition to support the doctrine that Jesus was a created being. Yeah, see, a traditional interpretation of a text can have ramifications. Right. If it's not true, it can have bad ramifications. You bet. So what was the consequence of the oral tradition uh, that was offered uh, originally by Justin Martyr when it came to the centuries later with Arian? Yeah, the consequence was that Christ, instead of the eternal being, second person of the Godhead, he became a created being. And there are groups that have latched on to that kind of teaching. The Jehovah's Witnesses are the mo modern revivalism of the Arianism yeah. heresy, that Christ was a created being, a demigod, right. a lesser than God. Right. So see, you start off with creating a wrong set of tracks. You go down a wrong direction or whatever you want to use the analogy there, and you end up miles right, off of the target. Right. I think that's, that's, that's where good Orthodox creeds can help you stay in the right lane where you need to be. Mm -hmm. Of course, you know, a creed is only as good as, as what it's based on. And if it's biblical, it's a very helpful tool, but it doesn't supplant the Scriptures. Amen. Well, I'll let you continue this thought of this Proverbs passage in the next verse, if you want yeah. to slide. Yep. Uh, in AD 25, uh, 325, I can't read, Athanasius rejected this interpretation of Proverbs 8.12. Athanasius of Alexandria also refuted, uh, to, referred to as St. Athanasius the Great was a 20th century, <laughs> 20th <You're not> <laughs> bishop. Can I start over? Can I read that over? Absolutely. Yeah, it's just, it's, everything is new and I'm just out of sorts. In 325 AD, Athanasius rejected this interpretation of Proverbs 8.12. Athanasius of Alexandria, also referred to as St. Athanasius the Great, was the 20th bishop of Alexandria. We've heard the phrase Athanasius against the world? Yes. Because of the, inf well, you know, uh, 
I got a grandson whose middle name is Athanasius. Oh, what a great <laughs> be named after an Athanasius. <laughs> because of the influence of this bishop, Catholics today apply Proverbs 8.22 to Mary and not Jesus. Catholics change their view as a result, uh, as a and as a result, changed oral tradition. All right. Hmm. The text does not refer to Mary any more than it does to Christ. Catholics must now deal with the fact that these texts, uh, the text says wisdom was with God before the beginning of the earth. So, deal with it. That's right. So. <clears throat> First, it was Jesus, and they said, oh, we made a grave error, a great mistake. Right. Athanasius is corrected. He's done a course correct in church history. That's not Jesus. He wasn't created. That's something different. It must be Mary. Right. Mary's the one who's uh, uh, co-redemptrix and mediatrix, right. and she's been with the gods from the beginning of the stuff. Right. Well, she's, you know. And that was a later development within Roman Catholicism. So Absolutely. So the question we ask ourselves is this. Was Mary with God before the beginning of the earth? <laughs> no. Not at all. Nope. She doesn't help create. She doesn't. She's not co-creator. None of that sort of thing. She's not the mother of the universe. Whatever no. titles have been given. Queen of heaven. Queen of queen of hell. Even. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we were driving through. And if you guys have been on vacation or been to Orlando, Florida, you can Google this if you want. If you're interested in this, driving from the place where we're staying to the theme park was a Catholic church, and it says Cert, uh, Church of Saint Mary, the Queen of the Universe. Oh wow. <laughs> and my, my wife Michelle said they misspelled M Michelle it should be Michelle <laughs> she wants to be the queen of the universe yeah. but we laugh because wow what a grand title Mary would never she'd blush if you would have called right. her queen of the universe right. uh, here she's this humble lady uh, teenage girl who's been gifted with the opportunity to bear the, right. the God in her mm -hmm. in her womb uh, never so what well, Catholics done with this verse is the tradition said this, but that us, that's wrong doctrine. Right. So then they make Mary this, right. which we also say is wrong doctrine. But yeah, definitely. They didn't correct it far enough. Nope. Uh, from the text, Proverbs 8, uh, which exalt the wisdom of God and which in the liturgy are applied to Mary, the most beautiful work of God's wisdom. Mm -hmm. And this that's is, in the yeah, Catholic Encyclopedia. So they just keep exalting Mary to where she takes the place of what was used to be Jesus in the interpretation. Right, now she's right. the very wisdom of God herself. Yep. Well, how did the Catholic Church change the oral tradition of this text? Yeah, I mean, they just changed it. <laughs> they, just, <laughs> they just went in there and changed it. <laughs> hoping it wouldn't notice. <laughs> Shifted it away from Christ and put it on Mary. Mm -hmm. And it should have been on Christ anyway. He, right. is, he is not a created being. Right. Um, what was their motivation for doing so? What made them change horses midstream, so to speak? Yeah, I mean, they wanted to worship Mary, I guess. I mean, they realized they couldn't say Jesus was created because that kind of goes against the other councils. Right. So they had to find somebody else. Who's the next most exalted person in, cre in creation? Well, it's got to be Mary. So they right. just said, uh, we hope you don't remember that one. We're going to switch and give you a new, new interpretation of this. So I'll look yes, at the next verse. Please. <laughs> in Catholicism... Over time, right. tradition acquired the same authority as Scripture. Cultural and religious and regional practices of the churches slips into the mm. tradition. So over time, tradition and Scripture become equal, equal weights, equal uh, fountains or streams of revelation. And what happens to tradition is cultural practices, regional practices begin to slip into the churches, these traditions, and, and these cultural traditions begin to have equal weight as the Scripture itself. Yeah. And why? Because the church says so. Absolutely. Uh, 2 John 1.12 Though I have much to write to you, I would rather not use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to come to you and talk face to face so that our joy may be complete. All right. Sounds like John's writing to the church, probably the church yeah. at Ephesus, wherever he's writing to. Right. And he just says in this opening of this second letter, I want to see you in person. Hope yeah. to see you soon. When I come, we'll talk. Yeah. Well, Catholicism mm. interprets this verse to mean that John gave the church an oral tradition. The secret revelation has been preserved in, in this oral tradition. So John told the church members here, and because of the, uh, the, the way that it's passed on through apostolic succession, or through the different bishops and so, so forth and so on, whatever John said to this, this church when he got there in person uh, has then whispered along and kept along orally, not written down, and right. then at some point later in the future, this is revealed. Yeah, so, so I guess uh, having church tradition... Get you out of eisegesis. I yes, <laughs> it does. Well, it was really told by John from the Holy Spirit through this passage of tradition. Right. Which is nowhere to be found in history. 
Well, does this verse explicitly teach that John taught the church new doctrine via oral tradition? No. <laughs> Why not, Jerry? Why are you saying no? Why? Because it doesn't. No. <laughs> I mean, obviously, you know, isogetically it could. You can make it say whatever you want. But exegetically, you know, in taking Scripture, uh, interpreting Scripture, obviously John is not going to give something that's not already been given. Yeah. He's not going to come Contradictory. Up with, yeah, there's nothing contradictory, nothing new. He doesn't even say, I, I talked about this because I've got something new to tell right. you. I've got a new revelation from God right. to, to lay out right. on you when I get to you. Yep. He, the text doesn't even hint that. He just wants to talk face to face to be in their presence. Yeah. Most of the time, you can take it at face value for what it's saying and get its meaning. S- yeah. Simple reading comprehension will get you out of a lot of binds. Right. It's simple as that. The Bible is not written in some esoteric, mysterious way that you've got to have some secret code to figure this out. If you just basic reading comprehension, right. it gets you out of most pinches. Right. You wouldn't read the newspaper like that. Right. So. You wouldn't read the, the article in the newspaper and make it about you no. or impose some mystical meaning into the p- right. print of the page. You would just right. say it's about the... Uh, rise in taxes or whatever this or yeah. this business coming to this location you wouldn't say ah this business coming to this location or say um let's just say that uh, a factory wants to open up in your town and it's in it's in the front page of your papers you wouldn't say this is some a symbolic way of saying that there's a revival coming to our community <laughs> right, right. Uh, you would just say that's the text of the newspaper says right. this I tried that mystical interpretation in, in high school on tests and papers, and it didn't work there. <laughs> so you're saying there's objective answers and objective I think there terms. is. <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't look at a math problem the same way you no, approach these no, texts. No. How about Paul's writing to the church, uh, uh, I guess the church where Timothy pastors? Yeah, that's Second Timothy 2.2. 2. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Now, Catholicism interprets this verse to mean that Paul gave a special oral tradition mm-hmm. to Timothy and the witnesses in the church. That he was saying there's something he taught in their presence he didn't write down. That, again, you're you're importing that into the text. Right. You're importing that he taught them something in person he didn't teach them uh, in the letters that we do have. Right. And this is where we need we discuss these issues with Roman Catholics. They will often say, well. Paul's letters are very short, and if he taught Romans, he stayed in this place, he stayed in Corinth for two years. Surely he said more things than what's in Corinth. Right. Surely he taught more truth than what we have. Maybe, maybe not. We can only be confident in what he did write, what yeah. he did teach. So if you say, well, surely he taught more and said more than uh, what is written down, you are speculating. You're yeah, going definitely. beyond beyond the black and white Beyond the ink of the page to the Amen. space between the text. Yeah, if, if Scripture is sufficient, then, you know, it, it says Scripture. It doesn't say Scripture and tradition, mm-hmm. just Scripture. So if it's sufficient, then there shouldn't be oral traditions. So that's yes. my case, man. I agree with you. <laughs> well, does this verse, verse teach that Paul gave Timothy and the church a secret oral tradition? It does not. And how could a person interpret this verse to teach that it does? <laughs> well, you're working with something you've already got in your mind anyway, mm-hmm. oral tradition. So you're taking that and you're twisting the scripture to fit what you already have. And that's you have not, a set of beliefs, right. yeah. the assumption of Mary. Yep. And you got to say, well, Paul must have talked about that yeah. when he went to this congregation where Timothy pastor. He must have mentioned right. it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so you're saying you start with this, this uh, predetermined information right whatever right. this is and then you find places to plug that in the bible right yeah that's uh i don't know it's uh forget what somebody called it but it's bible bingo or something but mm-hmm. that's just not how you interpret the scriptures and that's not how you would why would you interpret the scriptures this way yeah unless you have an agenda that's a good point the agenda is i want to preserve this doctrine that i believe right. the church teaches and so since i can't find it explicitly taught i have to find places where i think it's implied right and that's that's where Roman Catholicism creates the, the, the foothold for so many false teachings is right. the oral tradition. Right. Let's continue on here. Yeah. Jesus' words in Matthew 23, 1 through 3. Uh, the scribes and the Pharisees said on Moses, uh, Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, The scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat, so do and observe whatever they tell you, but not the works they do, for they preach, but do not practice. 
Well, Catholics interpret these verses to show that Jesus relies on the oral tradition of acknowledging uh, Moses' seat of authority, which has passed from Moses to Joshua to the Sanhedrin. Mm. Of course, Catholics insist that Moses' chair was replaced by Peter's chair, upon which each of the bishops of Rome in succession sit in succession as Pope. Unfortunately, the chair of Moses is nowhere in the Old Testament. Right. This means that it must have been passed down to the Jews orally and not in written form, but uh-huh. through their oral tradition. Obey the Pope for he sits on Peter's chair. Okay. Now, next week, not tonight, we'll take more time and talk about the chair of Moses. And right. if you guys are interested in what the chair of Moses is, I'm going to give you some archaeological evidence to show you what that is. So sure. if you're really interested in that, that's a teaser for next week, what you the bet. chair of Moses was. Well, but does Matthew, so before we get, we'll right. look at it next week, just asking him as, as this point, does Matthew 23 mention the office of Pope? <laughs> no. No. Not at all. You have to import that meaning into this other Exactly. Text. Exactly. Well, Jerry, since you've mentioned eisegesis ah. tonight, can you give us the difference between yeah. eisegesis and exegesis? Yeah, eisegesis is reading into the scriptures, interpreting the verse or passage with a preconceived assumption or an agenda. You believe this, so the text ought to believe this. Yeah. So when I read the text, it's got to say what I want it to say. Right. Mm, bad preaching. Mm-hmm. Exegesis, on the other hand. Is reading out of the scriptures. Right. Ex being out of the scriptures. Understanding the truth explicitly taught in the verse or passage of scripture. Yes. The scripture wants to tell us something. I'm personifying the Bible. It right. wants to give us a message. It wants to speak to us. We're just supposed to let it speak to us. Read yeah. it in context. There's historical factors you must understand. There's cultural factors you must understand. When you consider a passage and all those factors, it will tell you plainly what it wants to tell you. Right. I said, Jesus says, I got to find a verse that justifies my belief on this. Here's a text. Let me cram that in there right. to make it say what right. I wanted to say. Exactly. I remember years ago, I was visiting this church and it was in South Alabama. I don't remember the name of the church. Actually, it was in the border. Of, it, was in, it was in Georgia. It was in the border of Alabama and Georgia. Okay. I had friends who were attending this church and we went to visit with them. It was a Sunday morning, and they were having a fundraiser. They were trying to build a new gymnasium. It was kind of an up-and-coming church, and they were building a big gymnasium or something on the grounds. And the, uh, the minister read from the Gospel of John, John chapter 21, uh, the end of the Gospel of John, that miraculous catch of fish. And okay. Jesus you know, okay. fished all night, and he says, cast your net on the side of the boat, and they cast their net. And the Bible says they pulled up. Uh, John tells us they pulled into the boat, uh, the miraculous catch of fish. It's like 156. I think that's the number. And so the pastor said, 156. Uh-huh. We need to raise $156,000 uh-huh. to finish this project in the next in the gymnasium we're building. And he kept harping on this 156. And I thought, that's not how you preach that passage. Uh-huh. It's got nothing to do with the amount of money you've got left to raise. You just look for that number in the Bible, right. a roundabout number you need to kind of finish your project. And you've imposed onto this text your uh, financial, what is this, uh, a fund fundraiser right, kind of event right. to give to this right. and i thought well you've really abused this text you made it say what you wanted it to say yeah and people hear that make that connection you know hear that connection made in the pulpit like that and they think well this is surely a sign from god then mm-hmm. you know, cause here it says it right here in the bible and yeah it's just mystical too mystical and here's ways that's often done you've heard this before yeah you got to face your giants like david took on goliath well, that text is not about you facing your giants. You're not David in the story. Uh, if you want to look at type and shadow, David is the type of Christ. Right. He's the great great grandfather of Jesus. And Goliath represents death and sin and the devil and whatever else. And we're on the sidelines, too coward to face this. So he That's steps it. in front of us on the field and he faces that mm-hmm. giant for us. He wins the battle for us. Right. We get to enjoy freedom because the king, the future king, steps on the right, battlefield yeah. of our place. It's, it's, it's exalting man and mm-hmm. you know, that kind of interpretation. Or, you know, you've got to um, march around your walls of Jericho <laughs> and they'll fall down, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm not sure if I should be marching around walls of Jericho so that they fall or if I should be Nehemiah building new walls yeah. around the city. Am I yeah. marching to tear them down or building them up? Right. Which which eisegesis should I take in right. the situation yeah. in my life? Which and one it, works the best for you? It really becomes with what do you need and the Bible's got something for you. Let me find yes, it here. Yes. This text will be all about you. Yep. Now, we laugh about this and if you listen to the Bible and people preaching and they abuse the text this way first of all stop going to that church yeah. uh, if it's something a fluke or sermon talk to the guy privately if it's something that's happening continually don't be under that person's teaching it's a, right. it's a false teacher right but rome is a false teacher because 
they do the same kinds of things with their text. Right. The same kinds right. of things. Exactly right. But they hide it with the cloak of tradition. Right. Well, how does the interpret how does the interpretation of these verses demonstrate eisegesis? The, yeah. the Proverbs and yeah. Matthew twenty three and this preconceived idea, this teaching that you want to legitimize, you you plug it into some uh, scripture that you know you could twist it a little easier than others to get your point across. Mm -hmm. Anywhere there's tradition mentioned, you sneak it in there. Now, Jesus in the Gospels had more negative to say about tradition than positive. Exactly. Well, how does sola scriptura, the, the idea that Scripture alone is sufficient, right. combat the tendency toward eisegesis? Yeah, I mean, you hear, some, you hear some teaching like, you know, this is what Proverbs is teaching. It's, it's actually pointing to Mary. And you say, where does it say that in the Scripture? Yes, thank you. <laughs> in the plain teachings of the Bible, where does right. it say this? Because you should establish that an interpretation of a, a murky in text, right, that's not as right. plain, with a more plain text. Yeah, you can find, you know, plenty of Scriptures in the New Testament that would refute, you know, praying to Mary or saying things about Mary that, that you know, aren't in the, on, in the Scriptures. The mm -hmm. Bible has very little to say about Mary, very little to there, say. Yeah minuscule yeah and the, the, and that there's a reason you know that the catholic church has to come up with these other traditions and plug them in to the uh, source of authority got to fill the gaps yeah we'll continue on here so tertullian ah. thought and practiced non-scriptural expedient tradition expedient is a word that means in this case an action or con convenient and practiced although possibly improper or moral mm. something that is practiced in the church but was it it's probably immoral, maybe improper at best. Hmm. So here's some things that Tertullian taught. Hmm. Uh, he was a staunch defender of the faith. That's great. Yeah. However, he taught the following traditions. And we can alternate the next screen if yeah, you want. Yeah, yeah. He said, uh, before baptism, a believer must solemnly, solemnly profess this saying, quote, I disown the devil. So you go to baptize somebody, you got to say, RP after me, I disown the devil. I disown the devil. Now we'll baptize you. Yeah, well, I mean, that's not in the scripture. So. It's not in the scripture. <clears throat> and maybe it's okay to disown the devil, but that's not in any way told. No, it's yeah. not prescribed for you to do. No. It's a tradition, something he taught and yeah. practiced. Uh, be baptized, immersed uh, three times at baptism. And that's called Father, Son, Spirit. Right? Yeah, triple baptism. Mentioned yeah. it last week. And then not bathe for a week after baptism. You mentioned the kids would like that. Yeah, kids would love that one. Uh, believers must drink milk and honey after baptism. I mean, I mean not I, bad. Nothing wrong with it, but I mean, I'd rather have a Coke. But, you know, if I'm going to this church, I guess I'd have to do the milk and honey. It sounds mm -hmm. sticky. It does. <laughs> it's a different kind of a Lord's Supper, isn't it? Right. This is a baptism supper. Right. And then, of course, the, baptism, the believers who are going to get baptized trace the cross on their foreheads. Yeah. And we see that in Catholicism today where they trace it on their, on their torso. Right. And then they make the cross. That's a superstitious thing. Tertullian said this. If... Is it advancing there? No, it's not advancing. I want to make it advance. Uh-oh. Got to advance it. <laughs> now, those traditions churches have that you know, aren't necessarily bad, but you can't just require it of people. Like hanging of the greens. That's right. The green, I mean, I said the greens, collard greens, hanging <laughs> of the green. <laughs> right. That's a tradition, and it does emphasize uh, Christ at, yeah. at Christmas, but it's not a biblical tradition, it's something biblical, that we do. Yeah. You, can't, you can't, you know, make people do these kinds of things if they're not scriptural. And, I, and I'll catch his quote. He, say, he said yeah. this, quote, If for these and other such rules you insist upon having positive scriptural injunction, <laughs> you'll find none. Right. Tradition will be held forth to you as the originator of them. Mm -hmm. So he, he confessed that these things that we do at our baptism in our church or in our area, but if you can look for the Bible to find justification, you won't ever find it because oh, yeah. it's not in the Bible. Not in there. But now he his tradition was that he did these things. Hmm. The Apostle Paul, if he walked in his church, said, Why on earth are you crossing your foreheads and drinking milk and eating honey and <laughs> triple baptizing folks? He might have written Tertullian a letter right, right? <laughs> to correct some of this false teaching, right. especially if it detracts from Christ Amen. or if it becomes a rule for the faith. Right. He would have gotten a letter from Paul, wouldn't he? Yep. But what, what did uh, Tertullian say of his own tradition? Uh, you can look for him in the scripture and you won't find him. <laughs> Love it. At least he's honest. Yep. Uh, why do you think he maintained such traditions in his church? 
Why do you think he did these things? Uh, I mean, why would any church maintain a tradition? It's, you know, time you get to a, to the place in your church experience where it's a tradition, it's been there for a while, mm-hmm. and everybody's comfortable with it. But it had to start somewhere, and it was maybe started, you know, to reinforce something. Re, you know, baptizing three times reminds you of the Trinity. You know, maybe it had a kind of a legitimate reason, a good cause, maybe, but... It gets takes hold and uh, and and over, over time these traditions lose their meaning. They do. Why we do it? Well, we just do always. We just always way. do it, and it becomes you know carries the same weight as scripture over time. Yeah, it's like the old joke that the husband and wife had married for a few years, and it was her job to make the ham for the Christmas dinner, uh-huh. and uh, it was a it was a custom. Uh, and he was watching her one day. She made ham for Christmas for several years for their family get together. That she would you know you've heard the joke. It would chop off the ends of the ham and then bake it. And he watched her and finally said after a few years of this, why do you chop off the ends of the ham you're about to bake? There's no need for that. It's already ready to go. She said, I don't know. My mother always did this. So at Christmas dinner, she went to her mother and she said, and they said, well, mom, you taught me this. Why did you do this? She said, my mother did this. I don't know. <laughs> well, then yeah. asked her mother who was at the table, you know, her grandmother, and said, why would you chop off the ends of the ham when you do this? She said, oh, well, because we only had a ham pan that was this big. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so what a fine tradition it was. <laughs> right. So over time, that tradition lost any original meaning to it, why it was done in the first place, and it just kind of became a mindless right. thing you do. And that's what Tertullian says. You're going to look for the Bible. You won't find it. We just do this in our church. Yeah, yeah. If he made these things binding, uh, Paul would have had to intervene. I mean, yeah. if, if Paul were living right, in his day, right. would have had to send him a letter saying, stop it, yep. you're messing up the thing. Yeah, can't do it. So we have to check our traditions at the door. Every few, every few generations say, why do we do the thing that we do? Is it mm-hmm. biblical? Let's, let's get back to yeah. the Bible. That's why we've got to you know, preach exegetically, not eisegetically. If that's a word, I don't always, think eisegetically is a word, but it sounded good. Always eisegetically, maybe? Eisegetically, that's yeah. the word. Always be reforming, that's right. Yes. Let's take a look at Jerome, who lived a little bit later here. Jerome. Oh, Jerome. So, you want to take this one? Yeah, Jerome believed in the oral tradition. He was a Latin Christian priest, confessor, theologian, and historian. He clearly believed that if the church agrees on some doctrine or practice, it is as good as having... A Bible verse in Scripture and a binding commandment. Wow. Or command. Yeah. So according to Jerome, you just read that quote. What was the standard for truth that Jerome taught? Yeah, if everybody agreed with it. <laughs> it's inspiration by democracy. Right. Y'all agree with this? Raise your hand. Well, it's it's canon. Oh, man. And so you can see how that could be abused. And wow. you get off the path pretty quick. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. That's not the standard. Uh, I mean, a quote here. It says, yeah. don't you know that the laying on of hands after baptism and then the invocation of the Holy Spirit is a custom of the churches? Do you demand scripture proof? You may find it in the Acts of the Apostles. And even if it did not rest on the authority of scripture, even if it didn't rest on authority of scripture, the consensus of the whole world in this respect would have the force of a command. Oh, boy. For many other observances in the churches, which are due to tradition, have acquired the authority of the written law. As for instance... The practice of dipping the head three times in the layer and then after leaving the water tasting mingled milk and honey in representation of infancy. And again, the practices of standing up in worship on the Lord's day and ceasing from fasting every Pentecost. Mm. And there are many other unwritten practices which have won their place through reason and custom. That's Jerome in his book, Dialogue Against the Luciferians. Mm. Well, that's okay, unless they're going in the wrong direction and then... You just, you know, well, this is what we do. This is our custom. That's where tradition and has superseded Scripture. If this were the case, if the whole world were the standard for the truth, the consensus, <laughs> then Athanasius would have lost that debate. Yeah. Because he literally stood for the doctrine of the Trinity at a time when people weren't. Right. For the deity of Christ. And that's the problem with this kind of stuff, is that people are no longer familiar with the truth, and they, they don't know the truth. They hear the truth, and they think it's heresy. Mm-hmm. See, a week or two, a couple of weeks ago, I think the last time we were together, I said, let's rethink the church fathers. Let's stop calling them church fathers yes, and start yes. calling them leaders. Because when you say they're a father, you give them this, it's an appeal to authority they don't have. Right. I, don't care if it, I don't care if it's Jerome or Athanasius. I don't care if it's St. Augustine 
or even John Calvin. Right. Those guys did not speak with the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. They had done, had no authority to add to Scripture. They can only comment on it. And we have to say, whatever point of the church fathers or church leaders you may have said, they're all fallible. Yes. And unless they're quoting the Scripture, they're speaking fallibly. Yeah. So I want to, anytime someone has a quote, well, the reason we have tradition is because, well, Paul didn't say it. Yeah. He didn't say it in the inspiration of the Spirit. Jerome said it. So Jerome has no authority binding over me whatsoever. Right. Amen. Well, what were some of the things, and we mentioned a moment ago, that Jerome acknowledges tradition, but became equal to Scripture, the written yeah, law? Yeah, uh, bab- immersion three times, uh, milk and honey after baptism, uh, not bathing after baptism, mm-hmm. those kinds of traditions that he wrote about. Yep. You can walk into many churches today and say, you hold this tradition as high as you do the Scripture. Yeah. And this tradition has no basis in Scripture. Or it's, right. if it did at one time, it's lost its meaning. Let's stop doing this. And you have some people object, no, we've always done it that way. Yeah, you you, you will inevitably hear that. Well, why, it, why have you always done it that way? Why yeah. do you have the tradition? Well, I don't know, because we always said we've always cut the ends off of the ham, right? We've always <laughs> yeah. done this thing. Well, yeah. it's not biblical. Stop doing that. Yeah. Amen. Question 14. What did Jerome mean when he said, quote, and even if it did not rest on the authority of Scripture, the consensus of the whole world in this respect would have the force of a command? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> what what did he mean? I mean, if it's not in the Bible, it doesn't matter if it's not in the Bible because everybody else says it's, it's good, so it might as well be in the Bible. So let's just say it's in the Bible. <laughs> right. He makes the whole world uh, to have this uh, the authority of the apostles. Yeah, and that's... You know, you can see how the world goes at times, and if the consensus of the modern church is any standard of truth, we're in, we're in trouble because we've lost our way. Amen. Well, why do Protestants, and we can't speak for all Protestants, but as a rule, Protestants reject the authority of tradition? Yeah, because it, it, it doesn't fall within the parameters of Scripture. Whatever is in Scripture, the Scripture itself says it's sufficient, and if it's not in the Scripture, we don't, we don't, we're not, it's not binding to us. Mm-hmm. We can reject it flat out and say that there's no scriptural evidence for a pope. There's no scriptural evidence to pray to Mary or to uh, have a rosary and, and recite 50 Hail Marys. Mm-hmm. None of that stuff is in the Bible, and your tradition says it, but it's not in the Bible. The, the Bible is the final court of arbitration. Amen. Now, if it's a tradition that doesn't detract from yeah. the scripture, yeah. it doesn't take away or distract... That's perfectly fine. We've got plenty of traditions in our church, but oh, yeah. it's those that minimize Christ, that deify right. someone else, that distract from the gospel. Those you've got to chop out. Yep. Got to get rid of them. Yep. Call them. Amen. You know, John Baptist said, even right, even now, the axe is laid at the root. So it's time to start chopping some of that yeah. dead wood away. You bet. So let's take a look at a Catholic response to Sola Scriptura. Okay. And, and very quickly here, I just make note of this, that our Bibles and the Catholic Bibles are very almost identical, but the Catholic Bibles do do add seven books. They call the Deuter- Deuterocanonical books, the extra books, right? Mm-hmm. And we call the Apocrypha. Mm-hmm. Uh, but when, when, you, when we're approaching the Scriptures, we're going to be quoting just the 66 books that recognize. The Deuter- Deuterocanonical books we don't recognize as Scripture, right. but I want to kind of set that up. We'll put that on the table first. Right. Before we start, as we talk about the canon at this point. So, number one, the, and here's the argument you always find when you confront when you confront Catholics or vice versa. Here's the first argument. The canon of the Bible right. was created by the Roman Catholic Church. Yes, I heard that. And so this is what I this is what they would say. The books or letters of the Bible were, I will say this, were not written by anyone belonging to the Catholic Church. None. The books of the Bible were written by prophets, scribes, and apostles. Long before the founding of the Roman Catholic Church, the Catholic Church, as we know it today, did not exist until the 4th century with the Edict of Milan in 313 AD. The Edict provided religious tolerance across the Roman Empire. It is from this point forward that the Roman religion begins to diverge from biblical truth. Mm -hmm. This is an important event in history, Edict of Milan, 313 AD. In fact, I'm going to show you four doctrines added to the Roman Catholic Church's dogma, right, that are Purely paganism brought yeah. in after the Edict of Milan. So, let's catch these four. Hmm. Take the first yeah, one. Yeah, Catholic Mariology uh, was found in the writings of Origen, 
You can see there, 80, 185, 254. Origen lived in Alexandria, Egypt, which happened to be uh, the focal point of Isis worship. Gotcha. So while Origen does live and uh, move and have his being before the Egypt of Milan, we see why he taught this. It wasn't widespread among any of the churches until Egypt of Milan says, yeah, you can, uh, religious tolerance kind of right. opens the door for these kind of teachings. Right. It's mirroring... Um, the common practices he saw in Egypt. Yeah, I mean, and I think it kind of set the standard later on for how, you know, when Constantine declared Christianity the religion of the, of the empire, how they just, you know, people in droves had to become part of the religion, and she so just incorporate your idols, make them saints, and just keep going. Yep, that's right. Your bags are already packed. Just get on this train. Come right mm -hmm. along with us. We're gonna we're gonna check your bags at the door. Right. And the church lost its moral pure, its doctrinal purity yes. significantly from this point forward. Yep. The second one, let's take that one if you yes. want. Yes, uh, transubstantiation um, has its roots in several ancient pagan religions, including Mithraism, it's a Persian religion, which was very popular in the Roman Empire. Mithraism uh, had a form of theophagy or pagi, uh, the eating of one's god, as a ritualistic practice. Yeah. yeah. So. Like you said, the Roman Empire has a pretty big net at this point, and when these places became Christianized, they just sort of brought their practices yeah. on in. We're Tran comfortable with this. Yeah, transubstantiation is the the wine and the bread of the, of the Lord's Supper actually becoming the physical body and blood of Jesus Christ. Wasn't taught, wasn't believed in the early church. Apostles didn't teach us. It wasn't until the the uh, the churches began to scatter out and incorporate these false beliefs. I think you're up. Praying to the saints, uh, praying the saints to gain a blessing. Mm. The Roman pantheon of gods is the forerunner of the saints right. who personify different attributes and are dedicated to the different cities of the Roman Empire. And, right. of course, you can find out. You could find certain cities dedicated to certain saints. you got this certain issue you're facing in life. Pray to this particular saint. Yeah. You need this good luck at the next athletic competition or you have a herniated disc or you have a flat yeah. tire. There's a saint for that. Yep. And you, you could look at the pagan religions and... The many, many gods of the pantheons of pagans had gods for everything. Mm -hmm. And it's just the same thing, just kind of... Just a Christianized version of those. Redressed, yeah. Mm -hmm. The idea that the Roman bishop, the papacy, is the vicar of Christ, the supreme leader, Pontifex Maximus, of the Christian church, is a title borrowed from Roman emperors. And the titles were man, uh, maintained after the collapse of the empire. So we could go on and on and on and on and show where... Um, these pre-existing ideas are incorporated into the church uh, after it becomes a state religion. Right. It's sort of to maintain peace, religious tolerance. Uh, we basically going to let you keep your pagan customs, but we'll just Christianize them. We'll call them a Christian name. Right. Yep. As noted above, the Edict of Milan in 313 initiated an era of religious tolerance, mm -hmm. which caused the Roman Catholic religion to adopt many pagan practices. They weren't there until then, you know. Those things that they, that are Catholic dogma, uh, <laughs> they're not in the Bible. Early church didn't do it. Now they'll say, well, you've got to go read these into the Bible. There's verses uh -huh. you can find that that's in there. You just have to read this into it. We say, right. well, okay, nobody believed this until yeah. you incorporated these other yeah, beliefs. Yeah, nobody else drew that out of there. You know? Well, the reason, Jerry, they didn't is because it was passed through this oral tradition. That when Timothy, when Paul met Timothy face to face in this church, he told him this in private. When John finally got to the congregations of Ephesus, he told him in private, mm -hmm. and he was really telling him all these sort of things. So I would say, but how do I know it's legit? Then I mean, don't you trust the succession mm -hmm. of of the bishops? Don't you success, trust the succession of oral tradition through right. these men of the? Nope, I don't. And nope, I don't trust it. I don't trust. It. I don't trust, especially when it contradicts the plain teachings of right. the Scripture. Amen. Well, how did the quote religious tolerance? introduced by, by the Edict of Milan, lead to unbiblical doctrine. Yeah, I mean, it's just it's just so obvious how the paganism was just disguised and people didn't have to give up much. You know, they could become uh, part of the church, the religion of Rome, and uh, not really give up anything. They just change the name, maybe, mm -hmm. you know. We'll call it Christian. Then. And many, I'm sure, became Christian in name only. Oh, you know uh, it. They would say, well, we're, we'll call this thing another name, but we're going to wink, wink. We're still yeah. what we've always practiced. Yeah. We're still worshiping ISIS. <laughs> All right. Good answer. So um, we want to tolerate 
uh, people of other religions, but we don't want to tolerate religious ideas. Right, exactly. We want to be intolerant of false teachings, but right. tolerant of people. Yeah, I mean, uh, the Roman Empire tolerated many religions, Judaism included, and, and Christianity they thought was part of Judaism, so it was a legally accepted religion for a time. And uh, for this, the reason, same reason, you know, just give people their religion, let them worship, they don't cause trouble. Yeah, it's their pacifier. Yeah. It's the open of the people, right. Karl Marx said. Right. Yeah, so let them get high on their religion. They don't cause trouble when they're high. Right, right. But this Edict of Milan basically says we're not going to persecute anybody. We're going to let just everybody be their own thing. And then it becomes a state religion. And 13 years later, or whatever, so many years later, whatever it was, and became a state religion, then, then the groundwork is already established to incorporate these false teachings. It right. went from tolerance to acceptance. Right. And from acceptance to a mandate. Yeah. So whatever you tolerate in one generation, you'll mandate in the, to the next yeah, generation to come. Definitely. It goes from just letting everybody get along and these beliefs to it's all we're all right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, when it comes to tolerance, you don't to you don't tolerate a neurosurgeon who can't do neurosurgery. Right. You want to you almost say, Have you passed the boards? Have you done this before? Are you skilled? Do you practice neurosurgery based upon the the founded medical science of this procedure? He says, nah, I just, I've got another way of doing it, right? Yeah, yeah. I'll bury a chicken bone in my backyard. I'll yeah. put a, eat garlic that morning. I'll come in and I'll do, then I, when I cut open your head, I'll make sure to sprinkle in some cayenne pepper. And <laughs> right. No, no, no. I don't want you doing voodoo on me. Right. I want you to do what, the, what science says is going to work. I don't tolerate you doing brain surgery if you can't do it. Right. In fact, in engineering, the word tolerance is used a little different. It's in engineering, the word tolerance is to say um, it's the amount of air you can build into something mm -hmm. before it collapses. Every bridge that's built has an amount of tolerance right. built in. Right. Right. It's it's not really perfect, but we it's an it's it's perfect. It's good enough to to service these cars crossing this body of water. This building we're building has tolerance built into it. It's, it, it can sustain enough air because you know it, it's built sound enough to do right. what it's supposed to do. Right. Well, when it comes to religion, it seems like, yeah, we tolerate anything. Yeah. We'll let anything go. Yeah. Just for the sake of numbers, let's tolerate paganism and disguise it. And, yeah. Absolutely. Well, good observation. Well, the oh, Bible was yes. not created by the Roman Catholic it Church. It was not, despite what the Roman Catholic Church says. The Bible was simply recognized by it. Right. In fact, uh, the Roman Catholic religion did not dogmatize the canon of Scripture. Uh, to include it in the deuterocanonical books until the Council of Trent in uh, 1546. So there's not even a dogmatized, you got to believe these list of books uh, or you're kicked out of the faith until 1546, yeah. which is a counter Reformation movement. Yep. When the reformers said, okay, this is the canon based upon, you know, Jesus didn't quote from the deuterocanonical books, he didn't quote from the Apocrypha. We're not going to put them in our books. The Jews are recognized them as canonical. We're not going to put them in our books. Right. And besides that, you only have them in your books because they support purgatory or this right. other teaching. So we don't need to run to these books, which are, are not authoritative. But the Catholics and their counter reformation of Trent said, why are you cutting these books out? They've been around for a long time, and we use these books to help with purgatory other things. Yeah. We're going to make our, our list, and here's a dogmatic list of these books. That's basically how it happened. It's not that Protestants and the Reformation cut books out of the Bible. We just said yeah. those books are never in the Bible. Yeah, that's it. Exactly right. What really happened was the Roman Catholics and their canon of scriptures added these books. Right. They didn't write them in 1546. They were already around for a long, long time. Right. They just recognized them as authoritative because they already served a purpose for right. them. They were some of those isogenical, isogenical texts you could jump into to right. support your doctrines. All right, second one is this. Ah. Even Martin Luther, here's an argument that they're going to use. Even Martin Luther recognized the validity of the, the Deuterocanonical books. Even Martin Luther, and he's the great reformer. He recognized these books. Well, he was Catholic. I mean. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's good. Which Martin Luther are we talking about? Yeah. He was a German priest, theologian, author, hymn writer, professor, and Augustinian friar. Mm -hmm. In the response, Luther included the Deuter Deuterocanonical books in his translation of the German Bible, but he did relocate them to after the Old Testament, calling them Apocrypha. That are books which are not considered equal to the Holy Scriptures, but are useful and good to read. Now, what does the Apocrypha mean? Hidden. Yeah. So, 
he does keep them in his in his Bible. Like you may have many old versions yeah, yeah. of the King James Bible that has the Apocrypha in it. Right. It's been relegated to the part between the canons. We don't know what to do with these books, so we'll just stick them here. And Luther said, well, they're not authoritative. Uh, I can't call them inspired, but I'll keep them here because they have some historical value to them. Right. Like Maccabees. Maccabee does have, first thing at Maccabees, does have some historical value to Christians. It tells us what happened in the intestinal yeah. period between Malachi and Matthew. It tells us right. kind of what happened there. But they're not inspired. They're not perfect. There's chronological and historical errors in the, in the Maccabees, so you got to say they can't be. Right. Valid, but they do have some points of history that we should be familiar yeah, with. You sure certainly can't build any doctrines out of those books, and, and you shouldn't. Yeah. Let you continue on here. If you yeah, like. Martin Luther uh, demoted the Apocrypha in the German Bible. This is evidence that uh, he understood its position uh, in the list of Scripture. So you can't say that you know he included he included it, but he didn't legitimize it. That's right. Well, did Martin Luther? Consider the apocryphal no. books to be divinely inspired? No. no. Said he didn't. Right. <laughs> he said it himself. So we, we consider a lot of books good books to read. Yeah, Josephus is a, you know, I'll consult that a lot for some information. But... Yeah, books on biology and oh, history yeah. and science, books on auto repair, all good books that you want to consult to yeah. understand information, but not divinely inspired. No. That's a divine inspiration limits you to a very narrow area called the Bible. So the the chief of all reformers, Martin Luther, had these, and our response would be, well, he did, but he also said he didn't consider them to be divine. Right. He didn't put them really part in the canon. He's kind of in between the two canons. Right. Argument three. Mm -hmm. Well, Jerome's canon included the deuterocanonical books. Okay, Jerome okay. had this, and he's much earlier than that, so if he had them, they've got to be bona fide. Okay. Jerome designates a fourth division of the books, namely the Apocrypha. Apocrypha is named from a po, which means very, and uh, cryphon, uh, which means obscure, because their teachings and authors are in doubt. But these Catholic Church, uh, but the Catholic Church has received these books in the category of holy scriptures, whose teachings are not in doubt, uh, though its authors are. Not because the authors um, authors of these books are unknown, but because these men were not of known authority. Hence, the books have their power not from the authority of the authors, but rather from the reception uh, of the church. Hmm. Gotcha. And that's a book titled From Jerome to the Reformation. So the Catholic Church said so these books have authority, not because they're divinely inspired, but because the church has said they're authoritative. Right. So the church now gets to decide which books have authority. Yeah. So you've got, you've got the Bible and the Catholic yeah. Church. You've got the tradition. And now the church, they all three have this authority mm -hmm. now, the church really is the the main authority over the bible and the tradition though absolutely so jerome has it but again jerome is not the apostle paul no jerome is not jesus right jerome is not the, any of the apostles yeah. jerome is just jerome yeah he's just jerome just plain old jerome and he has no authority over me he didn't he can say whatever he wants to say right. you know, i'll just say unless it agrees with scripture yeah. jerome is wrong yeah here's the fourth one well the protestants simply remove the Deuterocanonical books because the books did not agree with the doctrines of the church. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Well, we'll, we'll look at the comment on that. Before we get to um, looking at this quote, this, this yeah. argument here, the, question 18 says this, what gave the apocryphal authority uh, divine inspiration over the church? Uh, the church. The church gave it authority. Right. Very good. So now the argument is this, well, the Protestants removed these books because the books didn't agree with the Reformation. Oh. And here's a quote from a leading uh, apologist for the Catholic Church. I'm blocking on his name, so I'm going to go back and catch it here. It is uh, James Aiken. If you're watching Modern Debates, this is a, one of the modern faces of the uh, Catholic apologi uh, apologetics. We're losing him on the screen. There he is. And there he is. is. Okay. So here's a quote, and I'll read James yeah, Aiken's yeah. quote. It says, In the 16th century, the Protestant reformers removed a large section of the Old Testament that was not compatible with their theology. They charged that these writings were not inspired scripture and, and branded them uh, with the pejorative, the apocryphal, right? Yeah. Catholics refer to them as the deuterocanonical books since they were disputed by a few authors, by a few authors, right? Yeah. And their canonicity was established later than the rest, while the rest are known as their protocanonical books. 
since their canonicity was established first. Right. So this is the standard Catholic position, Roman Catholic position, by James uh, Aikens, who wrote this in the in article entitled "Defending the Defending the, the Deuterocanonicals," hmm. and that's what they believe. Okay. And that is a historical. The fact is, these books were not widely accepted. They were widely rejected. They were not in every, You never find all seven books in anybody's particular canon. The Jews didn't quote from them. The Jews didn't accept them. Uh, the New Testament writers and authors didn't accept them as being canonical. Mm-hmm. Jesus didn't quote from them. Uh, they were not put in the. They were not considered divine, as we said earlier. So when Protestants gathered their b- list of bi- books, they left them out. They didn't, or rather, they didn't include them. They left them out of all the books they could have put. They could have put the Gospel of Thomas and the Gospel of Judas. They could have put a lot of Gnostic Gospels in the Bible, too. But they left them out for good reason. They were never considered divinely inspired. Right. They were never widely accepted. Right. They weren't quoted or authoritative by the apostles or Jesus. Exactly. So now the, the historical approach by Catholics now is to say, well, Protestants just left them out. <laughs> They've existed. Well, we agree they existed, but we agree, we have to agree that they were never considered canonical. Right. Mm. Well, were the apocryphal books universally agreed upon by the church? No. <laughs> <laughs> were these seven books in every listing of the canon? No. Were they in, were they in most listings of the canon? Canon, again, that's going to be no. They yeah, weren't in most listings. Three no's. So they weren't agreed upon. They weren't in most listings. They certainly were not in all listings of no, the canon. no. And the truth is, there was no universally agreed upon canon. In the first century, churches across the Roman Empire only had a partial collection of the New Testament. As the documents of the New Testament were re, uh, reproduced and circulated, the churches began to discover the wide array of writings. The collection of Christian documents grew organically. Over time, there came a need to weed through all these false documents and to compile an official collection. The books of the Bible were authenticated in several ways. Okay, so there's a few few ways that they decided which books made the cut, which books didn't make the right. cut. And it, these books aren't written by the church. They're recognized by the church. Right. right? So concerning the New Testament, did the, 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 the document have apostolic authorship? Did, in other words, is the name attached to this, this book, mm-hmm. the Gospel of Thomas, for example? Was it really written by Thomas? Right? So you had to determine, was it really written by the Thomas that we know in the Bible? Right. right? And so did it have authorship clearly attached to an apostle? If it didn't, it doesn't make the cut. Right. Secondly, concerning the Old Testament, did Jesus or the apostles quote from the document? No, they didn't. Yeah. Jesus quotes from every book in the Old Testament, except, I think, Song of Solomon. But I think he, quote, he gets the rest of them in. Right. And I think we've brought Song of Solomon in because we know that Solomon wrote the Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. So we're going to go, I think they, they brought him into the, his other book, Into the Fold, which is really a poem, mm-hmm. uh, a very erotic poem. Right. Uh, they brought that into the collection uh, because the authorship was by the same man who did write other inspired things. Right. Now, I've seen sermons, not many, but I've heard uh, allegorizing the Song of Solomon to mean the Bride of Christ oh, and that yeah, sort of thing. But we've got some hymns that uh, Lily of the Valley, the Rose of Sharon or whatever. The lily, he's the Lily of the Valley. And That's it. It's a reference to you know Song of Solomon, which is probably more about... A mar- marital intimacy than it is. Absolutely. So they've a- allegorized these to make these in some relationship to Christ. Uh, whether or not you think the Song of Solomon should be in the Old Testament, I don't know. Jesus didn't quote from it, but because it shares the author with other books yeah. that are canonical, they, they brought it in. But the point is, if Jesus didn't quote from it, it doesn't make the cut. He didn't quote from Second Maccabees. Right. He didn't quote from Bell and the Dragon or whatever the books are. He didn't quote from right. any other Gospels out there, any other Old Testament sources out there. Right. Did the Jews accept the documents authoritative? Now, these are their books. Yeah. And if they rejected them, why would we want to incorporate them? Right. If, if, if uh, someone, if a Jewish person if uh, said that the book of Daniel doesn't, doesn't, if they all said the book of Daniel was a fraud, well, we wouldn't have put the book of Daniel in. Right. Is, sec- next, is there logical consistency in the books? Meaning that, is there a theme that's taught and carried through? Or is it, does it contradict yeah, that's, you know, it, it begins to contradict. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, you, you, Scripture doesn't speak with a, a forked tongue. Amen. I'll let you continue on here. Yeah, Christians recognized the inherent authority of the Scriptures. They understood that the Holy Spirit had spoken through the Scriptures, through the pens of the apostles. Mm-hmm. Scripture has an inherent authority. It yeah. just is authoritative. Yeah. 
We yeah. don't make it authoritative. We just recognize it. Right. Uh, we recognize greatness, right? Yep. We don't have to make. I don't. You know, I don't make Michael Jordan great. I just recognize he's a great yeah, basketball player. He's a good basketball player. Anybody can see that. Mm-hmm. It's obvious. Well, did the church have authority over the scripture, or did the scripture have authority over the church? Yeah, scripture has authority over the church. Mm-hmm. Not so in Roman Catholicism. Nope. In Roman Catholicism, it is the church having authority over the scripture. Yes. It determines what is scripture, how to interpret scripture, right. how to apply scripture. The church has an absolute authority over right. all these things. Yep. In fact, the scripture says this. Jude, verse 3. Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Well, how was the faith, when faith means a system of belief, these things to believe, delivered to the church initially? How was it delivered first to the church? The oral preaching of the apostles and then through the written word later? Yeah, I mean, it wasn't. Yeah, I'm just going back further than the, the church, yeah. How was the faith system delivered to the other church? It was it was preached. Mm-hmm. And then Paul wrote some letters. Others wrote letters. And the church recognized these as authoritative. Absolutely. At some point along the way, uh, as the Holy Spirit led these men, the Holy Spirit led these men to understand you're dying, and these traditions can be passed along orally, but you want to preserve these most accurately. You want to write these things down. And so um, the faith was first delivered, obviously, initially in the early stages through the preaching of the apostles. But it was once delivered in the sense the same message was didn't just transmitted through pen and ink. Right. But it was delivered through the apostles. Amen. Once. The message was told once. Right. It wasn't to be told every hundred years at a new council, secret tr- information comes along that sheds insight, creates a new tradition, a new belief. Well, how is this different than relying on the centuries of councils? <laughs> the idea of once delivered faith. Yeah, I mean... Councils and traditions, it's always changing. And you see that in Roman Catholicism. And some of the dogma that's been added down through the centuries. Uh, you have the Word of God in, in your doctrines there, and it doesn't change. And you, you submit to the authority of God's Word, or, you, or you're, you know, you, you're, not, you're not having church. Mm-hmm. Something like that. I agree 100%. Let's finish the quote by the great late R.C. Sproul who said, quote, this, the Bible is a fallible collection of infallible books. Mm, well said. Well, Jerry, would you explain the distinction between the infallibility of Scripture and the fallibility of the collection? <laughs> well, the infallibility of the Scripture is it's inspired by the Holy Spirit. No error, no it's error. as God gave it. It's no error at all. Uh, the fallibility of the collection is, you know, Paul was certainly a fallible human being. Mm-hmm. And not everything he wrote was had the stamp of authority on it. I'm sure there were things that he wrote that didn't make it into Scripture, obviously. If they were authoritative and necessary, they would have been put in there. But Yeah, there's an allusion to a third Corinthians we don't yeah. have in Scripture. Yeah. Paul probably wrote many, many letters to churches we don't have. Right. The collection of the books that we have that make the Bible is made is put together by fallible men. Yes who just using the best reason possible put this together based upon the criteria I mentioned a moment ago. But what they have gathered is infallible. Yes. And the Holy Spirit guided, you know, the the church through these early periods of time to uh, recognize these things as authoritative. And uh, it's there to see. I mean, the Bible itself says the natural man doesn't comprehend the things or discern the things of of the Spirit uh, of the Bible because they're spiritually discerned. So, yeah, I mean, Christians can recognize the Word of God. Yeah, the Holy Spirit superintended the process. He inspired the revelation, the inspiration of the Scripture, yes. the transmission, the translation, the preservation of the text, right. the compilation of the text. The Holy Spirit is all over this. And while I do think there are many things that Paul wrote that aren't in the Bible, I think all we have is sufficient yes. for teaching, reproving, correcting, for making the man of God perfect and all. Right. The Amen. Bible is sufficient to do that thing. Amen. Amen. In fact, it says twice in the Gospel of John, Jesus did, Jesus did many, many things that are not written down here, right? Yeah. A lot of things he did that didn't make the cut. And we don't, when we get to heaven, you ask him about those things. Yeah, I think, you know, the, say the, the third letter to the Corinthians, you know, uh, Paul's not going to, we can, I think we can look back and, and having our Bibles now and look back and say that Paul wouldn't have said anything in that letter that would have contradicted 
the other things that he's written that are authoritative. Mm-hmm. So, Right. And he would have said nothing because the Holy Spirit directs the process. And if the letter was lost to time, he would have said nothing in that letter that we needed to hear. Exactly right. Exactly right. What we have in the, in the, in the Scriptures is, based on the Scripture itself, sufficient. Mm-hmm. Because God has said it's sufficient. Yeah. Second Timothy three sixteen. Amen. God has said it's perfect to do yeah. what it's supposed to be. Amen. Well, that's kind of um, part three in the Sola Scriptura. Mm-hmm. We're going to look at that again, I think, next week. Yeah. And then the week after that, we'll wrap up the Sola Scriptura, I think, right. as four parts of that. So we're just trying to establish the foundation of the bedrock for why we believe what we believe. Yeah. The Bible is so important. Yeah, I mean, there's lots of folks in the world that you know believe that uh, Roman Catholic and Protestants and Mormons, Jehovah's Witness, all of it's, you know, it's just part of one big Christian family. Mm-hmm. But... You, when you begin to zoom in on each faith, then you see there's major differences. Sources of authority. Protestants only recognize the Bible. Catholic, Roman Catholics have three sources of authority. The Bible, tradition, and the church. Mm-hmm. And uh, Mormons, Book of Mormon, Pearl of Great Price, other literature they've added to right. it. Jehovah's Witnesses, the Watchtower, Bible and Tract right. Society have all these other uh, commentaries to explain their scriptures. Right. They have even a, a translation that has been modified to preach their doctrine. Right. So, yeah. All, all attacks on the Protestant-like faith first attacks the Scripture. Yeah, every time, mm-hmm. every time. Any thoughts you close out tonight? Ben? No, I enjoyed the study. It was good to be back. I missed it. Back in the driver's seat, man. Thank you so much. At the round table. <laughs> Across the round table. Yes. <laughs> Thank you guys for joining us. Any pressing Always. prayer concerns, brother? Ah, uh, just a lot of sickness going around. A lot of people are sick. And- Pray for them. Worst time to get sick is in the summertime. It is. It's just a horrible time to be sick. So much you can be doing outside that's so nice. Right. Nice. We'll pray for your wife, Nancy. Yes, she's still suffering with it, so appreciate the prayers. A couple of folks in our church have been sick with things, so yeah. you close that Yeah, let's, let's pray. Father, we come to you, Lord, through Christ, and we know you hear our prayers because of Christ. And, Lord, we uh, are so thankful that Uh, You have a marvelous plan of salvation for the world. And we pray, God, that uh, you would continue to uh, draw sinners to Christ through the preaching of the gospel. Father, we thank you for the study tonight and for the the good mental exercise of of, uh, discerning spiritual truth and doing polemics and understanding others. Lord, not to uh, just put them down, but Lord, to try to lead people to truth. Father, we lift up the many in our churches and our homes that are under the weather. We just pray that you grant healing according to your will. Father, be with our country. Uh, be with those who will listen to these messages and uh, bless them in, in their studies. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Well, we'll see you guys same bat time. Same bat channel. Across the round table. Across the round table. Live there long and prosper. Nanu, nanu. <laughs> <laughs>